The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this month's um, Take 10, uh, a short and sweet and narrowly focused uh, webinar that's live. And today's topic is what the pros know about window fashion. So let's dive in and get started. All right. Um, well, first of all, if we're all window covering pros or we're designers that are selling soft furnishings and window coverings, my gosh, every window needs some sort of dressing, right? No more black holes, as I always say. But you also want to make sure that your styles and fabrics are appropriate for the room in the house. So often I can't tell you how many questions we get about, is this fabric going to work in this style? Or why am I having issues um, with this particular treatment um, on these kinds of rods? And why is it doing this or that? Usually the answer comes down to not understanding what fabrics work with what particular styles and treatments. And we're going to actually delve in some of that a little bit today but in more depth as we move forward with the spring and some of our other webinars that are coming up. Always keep in mind that your eyes drawn to the windows first. So, you, you know, if you have the opportunity to study a bare window, that's where you can sort of assess its shape, its architecture, what are its merits and needs, along with talking to the client about what her needs and wants are particularly. But also remember, window treatments have two sides. You got to consider what's happening on the outside as well as the inside. For most of us, that means specifying the correct lining and interlining. Um, again, a hot topic in a lot of times as we move forward, especially with all the polyesters that are out there, and then matching high content polyester linings. When you're lining something, um, like a faux silk or um, a, a poly that um, ester 100% that you know polyester that's out there, um, what happens is they tend to flare because they both have energy fields that repel each other, and that's why you're getting you know um, the volume, you're losing your folds, all those kinds of things. But then also it has to be pretty. I love this. Um, loggia where you can see that they did a Roman shade and they lined it with a contrast lining so it's just as pretty looking at it um, as the outside as it is on the inside. You can certainly learn from the past um, and what was in one um, decade might um, come around again two or three decades later. We haven't been doing a lot of swags, though I'm kind of going to step out on a limb here and think with some of the trends that we're seeing that we're going to start seeing more swags and Kingstons and empires, but done with a modern twist as we move forward in 2015 and 16. You want to keep in mind that if your treatment's elaborate, your embellishments should be simple. And those embellishments, um, you really need to take into account the scale and proportion of those details and where you're placing them. Because you want to not only take into account the window architecture, but does it work on the treatments itself? Is it good proportion and scale? So first work with the windows and then work with the room if you're a window covering professional. Because I, we're firm believers and I think pros know you've got to honor the architecture of the room and the window. Unfortunately, this kind of falls on my don't side. Um, arched window, sheer Roman in it, looks like it's the same sheer fabric with a flat, relaxed Roman over the top of it, but whether it was measured incorrectly, whatever it might be, I think we would all agree that um, there's probably was a better option in this office. And by the way, this was done by a well-known celebrity designer. Um, you also want to keep in mind that your rod face width needs to take into account the architecture. So often if you have deep pediments, you have um, arch, palladiums, pla uh, palladiums with side windows, um, you want to keep that in mind. Otherwise, um, the treatment looks like it's um, not part of the window. You also want to consider the space around the window. I've shown this often in, my, in a lot of my uh, presentations and classes, and I think what happened here is they measured the window, um, added what their typical guidelines are to the inside dimension of the cornice, and called it a day, and never took into account this crown molding that's up at the top, as you can see. And so everything shifted over. Now, how do you... Uh, um, deal with cutouts and things, especially with some of the woodwork and crown moldings that we're seeing coming into play in all rooms these days. By the way, 
Um, pattern placement is another key uh, professional tip or trick. I think that it might have been better suited if this motif was in the center and it was flanked by these two urns versus centering this one urn. Now that might not have been possible without seaming it, but um, to work with your workroom and lay it out and to creatively place the pattern probably would have made a big difference. Here you can see it in the room shot, wouldn't you agree? Um, so when you are working with cutouts and things, you know, one suggestion I would throw into your designer's toolbox is you can buy it for about $10 at Home Depot or Lowe's. It's a contour gauge. Um, most woodworkers and finished carpenters are using something like this. It's basically um, a set of steel pins. You can get it in different lengths, like from 6, 8 inches to 10, I think, or 12 inches. And when you push the... Um, contour gauge up against um, the profile of the molding or the cutout of a stair or whatever, it creates that profile. All you need to do is trace that and send that to your workroom so they can do a cutout. In a less than perfect decorating world, which we deal with every day, it really is hard to find perfect proportions. And um, to most pros, proportion and scale is everything in the room, and that includes your window and your treatments and your components within that window treatment. Now, definitely your furnishings are going to dictate the treatments, and we typically say height range supreme. Um, custom draperies never should be on the frame unless there's um, some sort of obstruction. Um, custom draperies are always up off of the frame. But when we start talking specifically about um, proportion and good proportion, here's um, a little guideline for all of you. It's called the Rules of Fifth and Sixth, and it comes from the Golden Proportions. And I don't have enough time today to delve into um, the math of it. I'm just going to give you the formulas and um, uh, show you how to use it. Typically when I, when I walk into a room and I'm working on um, a window treatment and I'm trying to figure out what the good proportions would be, what's the swag drop, what's the long point and short point of the valance, etc., I usually take my total overall length of the treatment, and for me usually it starts at the ceiling down to the floor um, as a starting point, and I divide it first by five and then by six. This gives me a guideline for good proportion for the parts of the treatment. So, for example, here's a, here's a window with um, cornice and panels. So the total overall in an 8-foot ceiling is 96. So if I divide it first by 5, I get 19.2, almost 19 and a quarter, by 6, 16 and a half. What that tells me is that somewhere around 19 or 20 inches is a good starting point for my long point on this balance. And my short point is somewhere around 16. Now you adjust all those depending on de um, design intent. But a lot of time designers are telling me they just don't, they need that starting point, you know, that to um, get, you know, started to design um, and keeping proportions in mind. And any good workroom will tell you that the difference between a long point and a short point should typically be about three inches minimum. Otherwise, you don't see the scallop. So you've already got that by dividing it by 5 and 6. So again, treatment's 120 inches. My top treatments are somewhere in the um, vicinity of 24. I divide it by 6. My short points maybe are about 20. So that gives me a treatment range. That tells me what my swag drop should probably be. I know that cascades should typically be three times your swag drop. So I'm somewhere in 60 or 70. Two inches is a long point on my cascades. I can go back to the window. Where does that fall? And make my adjustments for design intent. Stationary panels. Doing a lot of stationary panels, one of the things we're finding is we're kind of moving out of that. We're getting more calls about functioning draperies, uh, particularly for privacy and, and light control. Um, here's a couple of tips on um, stationary panels. Specify your stationary panels a third wider than your desired finished width. This adds the fullness to the width and not to each pleat. Um, so, for example, a panel that's stacked at 20 inches, so in other words, you're telling you your finished width of the panel would be 20 inches, I'd fabricate my finished width at 33. What I would do is take 20 inches times one-third and then add my overlaps and returns. 
another tip. If you're doing uh, batons and or even, even if it's stationary, we typically um, specify the overlap at one and a half inches. So I've got um, a smaller gap between my uh, lead ring and my second ring at the first pleat. Um, then I don't get it, to, it doesn't turn in toward the window. And particularly if you're using batons, it's easier to draw. Though batons aren't you know, easy to draw and you definitely have to educate the customer about baton draws. Some other things that t um, pros know about um, layered window treatments. You want to, you know, height reign supreme. You want to set things up higher if you want a more a leaner, sleeker, simpler look. Um, top treatments always look best when the scale of the valance is larger than the panels. And what I mean by that is valances and top treatments always take priority in proportion over panels. Panels should never be wider than the top treatment is deep. So if I'm doing a 21 inch deep balance, my stack is somewhere around 18 if it's a stationary panel. This does not um, fall in the uh, category of functioning pattern. But overall, what you really do want to be is a window fashion editor. You know, so often we get all these requests from our clients and we try to put it all into one window. The idea here is edit, edit, edit. Great design requires focus in the edit. And I got to be honest with you, this is one of my hardest things because I, I'm like, oh, we could do this and I'm a more is better person. Um, remember, it's not what you add that counts, it's what you leave out. And also, Think about, is this going to be flexible? Is there mobility to it? So, and then subtract out any redundancies. Do you really need two different types of tapes or two fringes or two pieces of trim in it? Um, think about editing it out. Because windows should be contradictory. They should surprise and delight in, you know, think about layering and unexpected contrast that can really make a dramatic impact um, with the window treatment in the room. And don't forget to create your signature. Sign your work. Uh, Rolly, um, Joanne Fabrics, uh, you can get you know, sticky labels, woven labels, satin ribbon labels, printed, you know, all over the place. Um, put those, have your workroom, put those into your work. Sign your work just like um, an artist would. So here's a couple of um, what the pros know, if you will, um, how to get that look. I always I love this um, look. This is a Barclay Butera piece. Um, I love. And typically, what you would do is mount that rod right down by the frame or right off the frame because of of the inside mount on the Roman shade. But there's no rule of that, so they added height by coming up as far as they could into the tented or the uh, trade ceiling. Then they added that valance with the tape, and the banding is what moves your eye through and makes that treatment look very cohesive and the panels then frame the window and um, I think this is a great a great look. Here's a room where you've got some odd assorted windows. I've got a window on the side of the bed, I've got doors that are higher. Designer decided, you know, mount everything at the same height so she moved up those draperies so that they could accommodate the height of the door. But look really closely, this is not a window. If she hadn't done this drapery treatment and put this piece of art here, everything would skew toward that door side of the room in vo you know, as far as um, visual balance. So by adding this second drapery treatment, and who's to say that you, know, you have to put a drapery treatment on a window, it balances the room out. Roman shades, pleated Romans, really sleek, love it, love that the pleated shade repeats the geometry of the room, but what I really love here is the metallic jam, where the, because what happens is the surface bounces light out into a, a dark room. And because light affects color, you know, you really want to um, keep that in mind, if you're, especially if you're working with uh, deep recesses and, and dark uh, areas in rooms. I often show this. Um, this is a fascia board. A lot of times you've got a client who needs functioning draperies but doesn't have the budget for a, a decorative rod and or a valance. And so to solve that problem, you can literally um, mount your white goods on a Travis rod on a board with a fascia that covers the um, white Travis rod and you would upholster it or, or cover it with the same fabric as the face fabric. 
Um, what I use for the fascia on the board is typically a two inch wood blind that I buy from my uh, blind vendor, whoever you might use. You don't need any holes routed in it. You can get it to the size that you need of the, of the drapery rod and you'll basically mount it in as a board mounted treatment. As you can see up here, this is the fascia that's covering the treatment, the rods mounted behind it. Anybody needs instructions on that, let me know. I can certainly send them to you. But my gosh, make sure you've got your draperies pinned correctly and you've got the right returns and the right return sizes. Here's a couple of installation tips that we, um, I got from actually Window Covering Dealers Forum on Facebook. Love this idea. Do you use a tenter hook? Do you use a screw? Do you use a um, cup hook? How do you attach your returns to the wall? Here they're using a, a picture hanger and here they're taking an extra slide and putting it next to the bracket and the pin fits right into it. Love that idea. And always, always remember if you're doing motorization, you need larger returns to wrap that motor. Grommets been a lot of conversation actually recently about grommets online so I um, thought I'd talk a bit about that today. A um, couple of things to keep in mind. They were really made for stationary treatments. If you have to make them function, you got to lift the baton and you have to teach the client that she's got to lift up the baton to make them work or use glide tape or wax or silicone on the rods that you're using. Uh, grommets were not made to be functioning. They were made for canvas and, and shower curtains that has a have a ring that goes through it. Um, so they don't have silicone inserts, etc. If you need something functioning, um, get a sample of Grama Links from uh, Rollies because it helps keep the spacing together when you traverse. Or use a grommet header tape. Always here's another thing that you don't you always think that you need to be uh, skimpy on fullness. You really need to be minimum two to one fullness, two and a half to one fullness. If you're using a big grommet like a 12 or some of the larger ones, you need to have at least six to eight per width. Um, so keep these kinds of things in mind. But again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sell them. Another tip that um, I just saw uh, one of the groups I'm in, and this comes from Julie Murphy. Don't know if she's on my broadcast today, but Julie, if you are, thanks. Um, is it to attach the wand to a drapery ring and then slide the ring between the first and second fold. That way the ring's hidden behind the panel and it will help push the panels. Here's another idea to steal. I love this. Okay, I really dislike this bracket because I hate the way it has to be mounted. Uh, it, you know, you just it's a lot of back and forth on it. So Anytime you need to get an exact mount with a template that come, or a, a bracket or a plate, a wall plate that comes out, make a photocopy of it, hang it where you need to on the wall, and then drill into the photocopy. Some other great ideas. This, two windows, right? An arch and a, a rectangular window. Love what they did. These are ripple folds. They disguise the fact that the windows are different and they brought it wall to wall. These are stationary. These are functioning. These are stationary. Love the way they did that. Here's um, a medallion treatment. Um, the eye, you know, meet, brings your medallions up to the focal point, which is the fireplace. The ang angled tops were cut into these panels so that they hang straight. A lot of times um, designers are ask, you know, asking me, how do you get that take up away? Well, what you've got to do is do a template and you've got to um, do an angled top. And by the way, who's to say that you always have to do the same look on every window? Here's a um, functioning drapery stationary panel over here, goblet pleats. Also, who's to say you have to use the same fabric on the same window? Here they alternated two fabrics. Or here we've used mixed media hardware. You know, again, typically this would be a white curtain rod that would be hidden up against uh, underneath the wooden pole. They brought it out, used brass, connected the two together with brass rings and mixed a lot of wonderfully contrasting textures and weights and really uh, made the hardware the, the focal point. 
this is from a Kansas City designer, and I'm sorry her name escapes me at the moment, but these are upholstered shutters, and then she had these medallions made. These, they're actually plaster relief, and so they ordered these as inserted. I love this idea. This is just, you know, used to do this a long time ago in the 80s and 90s, kind of gone by the wayside. Now that we're moving into functioning draperies, and if you have the ability to work from the get-go on a renovation or new construction project, you might want to consider build-outs and pop-out pockets so that you can hide the right hardware and the appropriate hardware for the treatment, especially on multiple widths. You need to be into architectural tracks, and they um, aren't pretty. So it means either a valance or a pocket like this. But a tip here. Make sure that your pockets are deep enough from the back of the uh, face of the pocket to the wall. Give yourself some extra um, room. And when you're doing that and you're placing sofas or furniture, or how many of us always have vents in front of the window, right? Here is an extend event. You can buy it online. It fits over this, and it can either go under the sofa like this, or it can, it can shoot the, um, the hot air or cool air um, out and away from the draperies so the draperies aren't blowing. Another ex example, again, who's to say you can't have fabric? Oh, two different fabrics on these Roman shades. Cornices and lambrequins and cantoneers. This happens to be Alexa Hampton from Kipps Bay uh, from last fall. Love this Moroccan look with the draperies and the banding. And what she did is she did smocking tape and smocked almost like a sleeve with a face fabric and then attached it to the top of the cantoneer. Or here's a cornice that follows the shape of the peak ceiling. Who, who's to say you can't use drapery rings other than on a drapery rod? Tab tops on these um, plexiglass rods and then these are drapery rod, rods that are sewn together and notice this is flat and there's fullness in the shear below. So it looks like it's a Euro pleat here, but a flat there. Or, yeah, no, I don't, this, I don't think this is a two-inch box header now that I look at it. Maybe, may, I think it's more of a Euro pleat. Or when you're working with shears, how many of us don't like the idea that you've got to wrap uh, a shear around buckram and it shows? Pick up the um, side panel fabric and use it as a facing on the shears. It unifies the window. Or contrast facings, uh, taped headings, contrast borders and linings. Um, this is also from Kipps Bay. Love the fact that they use the antler tie back. Or instead of sh typical shears that have fullness, this is nothing more than a scrim panel that has a weighted bottom and a banded side. This is one of my favorite installations. Um, love the fact that they picked up this Icot fabric um, and banded these draperies. Really makes a statement. But even more so, I really love what's happening over here on this window. And it's actually um, iron, and it's been laser cut, and it's a panel that fits into it. Isn't it awesome? Going with that whole sort of idea of panels and shears, here's um, another uh, way of doing it. Shear draperies. These are um, nothing more than shear uh, flat panels that have Velcro on four sides that have been Velcroed to a frame that is pressure fitted into the uh, jam of the window. Sometimes we walk into a job where the customer already has um, shades up and transom windows. And we know that good design really says that we've got to move the uh, drapery rod up to the, um, over the transom for proportions. But um, then how do I hide the headrail on the uh, cellular shade? In this case, what we did, as you can see, she had cellular shades. We ordered the 3.5 inch or the 4 inch um, premium valances from a blind manufacturer. We were able to match the stain in the window. Otherwise, you can order it unfinished and stain it yourself. And then we attached it with um, angle bat brackets or the screws back on a Kirsch wooden center support bracket will also work. 
As I mentioned, there's a lot of traversing systems that are um, coming onto the market because our clients are really starting to ask for functioning drapes. So when do I use it? When do I sell or function over, you know, over aesthetics? Well, it's maybe when the drapery specs require it, do you need to use a system? Um, ease of use, convenience, um, it's, you know, maybe an elderly client or, you know, it's eight or ten widths of draperies that are going to be hard to um, pull, um, maybe with weights and motorization, or maybe the design intent is that she wants it functioning but no top treatment, so you're, you're going to use the hardware as a top treatment. Traversing sy systems can offer lots of multiple solutions, but here's the key. Every, and this goes, by the way, for stationary panels, but particularly in traversing systems. Every designer must know the weight limitations on your hardware that you're using. For example, and I'm not calling anyone out, I just want to use this as an example. If you're specking the Kirsch designer metal rod, it holds nine-tenths of a pound per linear foot. And if you use the fluted rod, it's a pound and a half per foot. So that means that if you have a drapery that's eight foot wide, okay, the rod itself is 96 inches, that drapery can't weigh more than 7.2 pounds if it's a smooth rod, 12 pounds if it's a fluted rod. So one of the things you have to really be cautious of these days is starting to figure drapery weights. And not all of us have been in, you know, in the maybe doing this or you know are familiar with this. Um, you have to know the limitations. By the way, any drapery hardware manufacturer can tell you what their weights are per linear foot, and with the formula I'm going to give you, it will show you how to figure it out. So um, whether or not you're just using drapery fabric and lining, drapery fabric and blackout, blackout um, and interlining, or this thou pound and a half also holds for lining and interlining. So 35 yards of fabric. Um, you know, that's probably about eight, that maybe is about ten widths. Um, at a pound and a half per yard weighs 52 and a half pounds. Will your rod hold that? You know, that, and this also falls with maybe you have smaller multiple widths, but you're doing something that's 180 inches long, so you've used 35 parts. So if you go back to that 96 inch window, Let's say that's probably what five widths. I'm just guesstimating. That's five widths. So I've got three. I got 15 yards of fabric, and I'm going to line and interline them. Um, I've got 15 pounds just if I'm using blackout. And remember, the maximum that that rod would hold was 12 pounds. That's why your brackets are coming out of the wall. That's why things are bowing. Um, that's why they don't function properly because those Travis rods are made to hold. Once you go over the maximum weight, they don't function properly. So know your drapery weights. The other thing that I come across probably more than anything right now, and especially with ripple folds, is the flaring like you're seeing in this picture. And when you're working with polyester fabrics, as I mentioned, and or ripple folds, you've got to do memory stitching or flagging at the hem. You have to do something to control those uh, folds. This can be done by your workroom, by tacking a crochet weight or an upholstery thread weight at the back side, or this can be done with a no-sew technique from uh, Rolly's pleat stabilizer system. Also, remember, if you're mounting valances, here's another tip. If you're mounting valances um, at the ceiling, you want to install at least four inches below that ceiling. Otherwise, you can't create that, you create this crevice like you see, and you get all this shadowing. Window treatments can never be too full. Skimpy draperies or curtains can ruin an otherwise great window. Minimum two and a half fullness. Much better, right? Here's a series of windows. Doesn't that look great? This, this was actually an add-in. I had to throw this in because I think this is a styling error versus a, a fabrication error. I think what happened here is they're like, oh, we've got a beam in the way of our arch window. Oh, well, I ordered these goblet pleat draperies to be made. Oh, so no problem. I'll just take the pleat out. I think that's what they did is partially took the pleat out. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, this one hangs kind of funny. Uh, but I just thought it was interesting. Is like, you know, know what's happening in the space around the window. Great 
look here again mount, mounted to the architectural pediments of the window and what they're using is actually Kerflex or um, notched right angle swip, strip from Raleigh because as you can see there's no rods. Would you rather have this look as a pro or this? And really it comes down to working with your workroom no matter what you're doing if you're working with patterns is to know what um, to center, know how to place patterns, know how your workroom fabricates so that it can be done. This is interesting, isn't it? I think that, again, these are probably ready-mades, but mounted incorrectly. Interestingly enough, I think there's little roller shades up under those valances for these cafe cut curtains. Because the, remember, the visual weight always goes to the valance. Two things about Roman shades. You need to know what that finished length is going to be. It looks, nothing looks worse than having it sit on a sill like this. Or cr you also need to have stabilizer bars so you can uh, eliminate cratering. Um, here's a tip for you when it comes to tied back draperies, whether it's going to be in a window wall or the customer doesn't care for that tie back take, take up that um, kind of simulates a, a cascade look and sometimes you see the lining. So you, what she wants is the um, hemline of the drapery to be at the floor rather than taken up from the blousing of the tie back. And again, what you have to do is you have to cut an angle top to it. But last but not least, really what the pros know is all about celebrating the details. Dressmaker touches can turn anything, even if it's ready-made, into a wow window treatment. Whether it's extending your drapery rod from window to window and hanging a piece of art from it. But by the way, this is another cha-ching factor. You just sold how many X more brackets and um, you know poles? or this is actually from the HGTV in Boston. So it's a master bedroom that had a ensuite bathroom in it and they realized that the while you were in the bathroom you were uh, missing the amazing view out onto Boston Harbor. So they put a window in the room and then they went, mm, that's a great idea, but what if you do want some privacy when you're sitting in the tub? for whatever reason it might be. So this is a motorized roller shade that's been digitally printed so it looks like it's a piece of art when it's down or you can lift it up when you want the view. Have you thought about mirrored cornices? Um, working with a mirror and glass guy you will find that um, they're really not as expensive as you think um, and you can do some really amazing things with them with antique mirror, gla you know, beveling, all kinds of things can be done that really can give your window treatments that shine and luster and that, that hint of glamour. But remember, no matter how beautiful it is, if it's not dressed properly, and that takes a really good installer, it's just not a success. Well, thanks so much for coming today, for talking with our Take 10s, and if anybody has any questions, please type them in. And here's what we've got coming up in the next month or so. Um, Jackie and I will be doing, Jackie will be doing an um, how to design your own fabric webinar on uh, next Wednesday. Um, later in the month we'll be talking about digital business models for soft design pros like e-design, virtual consultations, um, those kinds of things. And then in April, right around tax day, we're going to be talking about profitable partnerships. And this time it'll be how to work with designers and workrooms, how to work together. Uh, don't forget that um, uh, Soft Design Lab is hosting, Jackie and I are hosting a High Point Spring Market Buyers Tour. Um, it's almost filled up. We've got a couple of more seats left, but come with us to market. We've got loads of things that are um, definitely on our plate. We're really excited about it. Today's recording is, um, today's webinar, excuse me, is recorded, but please give us about 48 hours to get it up and running. We'll send you out um, a link. It's always on our YouTube channel, and it's always on our Take 10 webinar page. Um, if, again, if you want the board-mounted fascia instructions, either drop me an email or type it in your question box, and I'll send it to you. And... Um, uh, Michelle, when you finish, could you show the slide with the molding? Oh, the pockets? Sure, I'll go back. 
Um, is, is it the pockets you want, Michelle? Here we go, back, back, back. I probably should have just put it on slide thing, sorry. Okay, here you go. Is this what you like wanted to see, Michelle? So you've got pocket draperies. This is a double mold. This was actually extended mold. We've done this before where we built pockets and then we needed to actually extend for whatever reason. Um, and then how explain more about how you demo the contour gauge. Sure. I'll just put a picture up. So with a contour gauge, it comes in different lengths, like 6-inch, 8-inch, whatever. And it's a steel, um, it's a piece of uh, steel conduit that has a set of stainless steel pins in it. So these are all stainless steel pins, and they move back and forth. So you basically grab the contour gauge, and you put it up against um, the molding or whatever that you need cut out. Um, you could do it with a stair step, crown molding, tile bull nose around a sink, sill, whatever it might be. You push it up. When you push it up against it, it creates the profile of the um, cutout. You would trace this on a piece of paper. You would have the actual dimensions. It's almost it's just like making a template for a window. You would send that along and tell the a workroom where, in fact, on that panel you want this cutout done. Anything else? Let me see. Now, um, guys, give me a couple of days to get the fascia instructions off to you. Um, as I said, don't forget this will be recorded and up on our page. And thanks so much for coming. Everybody have a great weekend.